Good morning, as Dave said, uh, my name is Warren Simpson. I'm the federal program manager in our office down in Salem. Um, right now our office is a little short staff, so you get me instead of Andy and, and uh, my boss, Andy Eno. So um, I'm gonna handle personal conveyance, but we have um, it, anyone that you call and talk to in our office can help you out with this question, Lisa, Andy, and me, because we have lost a few folks. Um, those of you might know Bilal Temsa. He didn't, he didn't leave the agency, but he moved down to LA where he's from and he's handling um, uh, hostage load situations, things like that with household goods. So, and then his replacement was Sherry Sell, who was kind of like my assistant. Uh, she was our program analyst. Sherry is currently at the academy in Norman, Oklahoma, um, st studying and working on um, trying to pass the academy to be a safety investigator. Um, and also, you might have, call, if you've ever called our office or worked with the state, our state program specialist, David Rios, just recently left uh, to go to the same position in Arizona. So our office is pretty short staffed right now. Um, so uh, if you have any questions or you call and the phone rings, that's probably the reason why we're pretty swamped. Um, my position at, uh, in our office now, I, I do a lot of the assigning for reviews. I do all the approvals for uh, compliance reviews and safety audits by both federal and state. Um, I also handle all of the upgrades. So if your company unfortunately received an unsat or, sa or a conditional review, now those are all back in my pla on my plate to do upgrades. Uh, and then I also process all of the enforcement actions. So, um, and then Andy is handling all of the state programs uh, work. So we are very busy at this point. <laughs> so um, just a little bit about me. This is my 29th year with the agency. I did 15 years as a safety investigator, I, one year in DC, and then I'm on my 13th year as federal program manager uh, in Salem. I'm also an instructor uh, in Sh at Chemeketa Community College down in Salem. I teach at the Salem campus. I'm an accounting instructor at the Polk Center in Dallas. And I also teach in all three of the state prisons, accounting, business, and computer science. So I have a little bit of uh, full plate as well. How many of you have ever heard of personal conveyance or have heard of the new changes? Just raise your hand for me. Uh, hold them up, straight up like that. All right, how many of you think the refs blew the call in the Saints-Rams game. <laughs> Hold the other hand up. Perfect. I'm also a football referee in a white hat. So all of you that have, you got one signal down now, you got touchdown. So uh, we should send a sign-up sheet around because we need more officials in high school sports. So anyway, I've, my job today is to cover personal convenience and then also I'm going to be talking uh, about a correlation study that our agency is doing as well to, to make changes to CSA. So. Um, Remember, I've got the, the clicker here. So personal conveyance. So we have this, the, as of December 2017, um, the agency made some revisions to the rule, um, or to, the, to our, basically our guidance. Um, the motor, motor care is now at, hopefully you can read that. I didn't realize it's such a large room. Um, motor carrier is now at their discretion, so the motor carrier needs to make a decision whether or not they're going to allow for personal conveyance to be used by their driver. Uh, that's the first thing. The other thing is the drivers, um, if they're still driving the vehicle, you can't violate Part 392, being ill or fatigued. Okay, so those are two of the uh, main concepts that you need to be aware of. Um, the movement of a commercial motor vehicle it, for personal use while off duty. So we're considering a driver that's using personal conveyance as someone who is in an off-duty situation. So that would include an ELD, they would just log this as an off-duty situation. Um, so one of the conditions for off-duty is you have to be relieved from work and all the conditions of work. So that's another um, reason uh, a driver may use the personal conveyance for commuting back, back and forth um, home as well. Um, they have to continue to operate the vehicle safely and there are limitations in the scope and, and uh, more restrictive than the guidance. So let's take a look at what some of these options are. Hopefully that, is that going to fit in there? Okay. So a driver can spend um, his time traveling en route from, for lodging. So that would be motel or truck stop to a restaurant. So that's not really a change. We've had that 
in the personal conveyance guidance before. Um, they can also commute between their terminal and their residence, uh, between trailer drop lots and the driver's residence, and between work sites and his or her residence. Okay, so kind of like a commute. You mentioned the taxes. It's kind of like if you're you don't get to deduct your personal commuting time. Well, on this case, it's similar. You know, you would count this as off-duty time if you meet that requirement, that condition. Um, time, unfortunately, this is really long. Time spent traveling to a nearby re reasonable, safe location to obtain required rest after loading or unloading. Um, the driver, uh, the time driving under personal conveyance must allow the driver adequate time to obtain their rest. So just remember part 392 still applies in terms of rest. Okay, there's about seven scenarios. So moving a commercial motor vehicle at the request of a safety official. Um, during a driver, during a driver's off-duty time, so that might be another condition. You, the driver would log personal conveyance. Um, the next one, time spent in a motor coach. So this is a sort of a change um, without passengers in route to lodging. So if you're a motor coach company, however, if you have passengers on board, it still has to be driving. It can't be off. It can't be off-duty. Time spent transporting personal property while off-duty. That's also. Um, considered off-duty, it's all basically part of 390.3. Um, and then authorized use of a CMV to travel home after working or an off-site location. So that's pretty much the, the main use of personal conveyance you're going to see is um, drivers using it to commute back and forth. All right, what these are things you can do. Here's what does not qualify as personal conveyance. The movement of a commercial motor vehicle in order to enhance the operational readiness of a motor carrier. For example, um, bypassing available resting locations in order to get closer to the next loading or unloading point or other scheduled motor carrier destinations. So this is generally um, one of those things where it's kind of a scenario based. So a carrier will call in and say, we have this type of situation, uh, Would you? could we use this as personal conveyance? So I would probably ask a set of follow up questions. Okay, um, after delivering a towed unit and, and the towing unit no longer meets the definition of a commercial motor vehicle, um, the driver returns to the point of origin under the direction of the motor carrier to pick up another towed unit, so that doesn't count as personal conveyance. And continuation of commercial motor vehicle trip, I can't read that, it's a little too small, in interstate commerce in order to fulfill a business purpose, including bobtailing or operating with an empty trailer in order to retrieve another load or repositioning a commercial motor vehicle, tractor or trailer at the direction of the motor carrier. That's generally kind of the questions that we'll get is, well, I just dropped this and I wanna to go to a location, would this be considered personal conveyance? And one of the questions I would probably ask is, well, where are you headed to? What's your, where's your next dispatch? that kind of thing. So if the dispatch is known, um, and you're repositioning your commercial motor vehicle, you're not going to get to count that as uh, personal conveyance. Okay, um, passenger carrier, uh, the the rule now says you can be laden if you're hauling freight. That could still count as personal conveyance. However, if you're a motor coach or passenger carrier, if you have passengers on board, that's not considered an off-duty situation. You still are in charge. You can't be released from duty when you have passengers on your vehicle. So for freight, you can be laden, but for passengers, you can't. And also, um, if you're transporting a vehicle to a facility to have the vehicle maintained, transporting a vehicle for maintenance, uh, that has to be considered on duty. Well, that's actually driving time. And the final one, after being placed out of service for exceeding the maximum period permitted under Part 395, time spent driving to a location to obtain required rest unless so directed by an enforcement officer. So if you're directed, that could be considered personal conveyance, but for the most part, it's not. And I think there's a couple more here. Time spent traveling to a motor carrier's terminal after loading or unloading from a shipper or receiver. So a driver d delivers the load and wants to head back to the terminal. That is considered um, driving time and can't be used for con personal conveyance. 
and then time spent operating a motor coach when luggage is stowed, the passengers have disembarked, and the driver has been directed to deliver the luggage. So that would still be considered driving time. Yeah, I think I've got more. Okay, so that's pretty much the information I wanted to share with you in terms. Um, our website has more information on personal conveyance. Uh, you can go to the website at www.fmcsa.dot.gov, type in personal conveyance, and it will pull up a whole list of pages of information if you have any additional questions. Um, you can also email our office. That's my email address. The DOT um, structure for email is the first person, the person's first name, dot last name, at dot.gov. So. In our office currently, if you're going to call, if you want to call or email, uh, one of the three of us, uh, me, Lisa, or Andy, would probably be one you'd want to shoot an email to. In fact, Andy's been doing all of the training for personal conveyance, so um, any one of us. Um, and then our phone number here in the office is 503-399-5775. And I have some business cards as well I'll leave with you. So let me... Uh, so can someone tell me, is personal conveyance treated any differently when the driver is hauling hazardous material? Anyone know the answer to that question? <coughs> That's kind of like teaching at the college. I mean, my students are quiet. And um, usually I call on somebody and then I, if they can't get it, I have them phone a friend or pick a number of a desk and whoever, no, I'm just kidding, I won't make you do that. Uh, the answer to that is no, there's no restriction on personal conveyance regarding hazardous material transportation, provided that the driver complies with the parts in 177, operating a, um, transporting hazardous material in parts 397, if that applies, okay. How is personal conveyance time calculated in the hours of service rules? This one should be a gimme. Good. Log it as off duty. Thank you very much. That is correct. Um, are there, is there a maximum distance time or distance limit for the use of personal conveyance? Yeah, that's. I think that's probably the right answer. <laughs> that's the answer we were talking about yesterday. The answer is no. However, it's important to note that the provisions in Part 392 of the regulations, so ill or fatigued driving, uh, prohibiting the operation of a commercial motor vehicle while fatigued, continues to apply. Therefore, a driver must get adequate rest before returning to driving. So there really isn't a limit. Uh, I have heard 50 miles an hour, um, but the answer to that question is there's not a limit. Okay. Um, next question. May a driver who drops his or her last load at a receiver's facility use personal convenience to return to their normal work location, i.e. their home or their terminal? What's the answer to that? Okay, good, no, the answer is no. Returning home or to the terminal from a dispatch trip is a continuation of the trip and therefore can't be considered personal conveyance. So just remember, you're going back to the terminal, that's still driving time. Um, does anybody know what the term off-site means when um, referring to the personal conveyance guidance? What do you think off-site means? All right, the term refers to a location other than the carrier's terminal or shipper or receiver's facility. So think of those uh, where a driver works for a temporary period for a particular job. So this would be like someone that um, gets sent out to a job site, maybe a remote location, considered off-site locations. Therefore, travel between home and that off-site location is considered commuting time and qualifies as personal conveyance. Or let's say they're stationed at a hotel driving back and forth. That would be the same thing. It'd be personal conveyance, it wouldn't count as driving time. Um, let's see. May a driver use personal conveyance when they run out of available hours? Okay, yes, no, the answer to that is no, except for one exception that's described in the guidance where a driver who runs out of hours while at the shipper or receiver's facility may drive from that facility to a nearby safe location to park, provided that the driver allows adequate time to obtain rest in accordance with daily minimum duty periods. Uh, personal conveyance is those times where a driver is operating solely for non-business purpose and cannot be used to extend the duty day. So kind of think about that. You can't be extending your day. Like I said, the main question I get in the office is, 
it's giving me a scenario and it's trying to reposition the vehicle closer to the next dispatch, that would not be considered personal conveyance. Um, can a loaded vehicle be used as personal conveyance? So this is the major change. We used to have it was laden, you couldn't, okay? Uh, but now the answer is yes, it can be. Um, if, it's, if it's laden, and that's for property or for freight, but what about for passengers? No, good. I got east and west from a couple of you. Um, and how about if the, they're transporting stowed luggage? So no passengers on board, but if you're transporting and delivering stowed luggage, Delivering, your, that's still considered um, on duty, not driving. You can't be released from duty when you're still performing a work function. Can a driver be inspected during personal conveyance? If so, what's the driver's duty status during the inspection? Yeah, he would be on duty, right? Why? Because when you're inspected, what are you required to do? Exactly. Be in, you're required to be in a readiness to work. Okay, so for that, you would be either driving or you would be in an on-duty, not driving condition while the inspection is occurring. Any questions? The clarification. So from the shipper, you can go to a restaurant or a hotel yeah. and back to the shipper. But if you go from the shipper to your terminal, then you're on duty. That's correct. Then well, it's that's considered driving. Yep, you got okay. it. And what was your question? So would that include motor coaches? So if I'm dropping a group at Crater Lake Lodge, uh -huh. but they want me to stay way down in the village, and they booked a room for me down there, is my yep. drive down the mountain to the village, is, would that be considered off-duty or personal conveyance? Yes, because you're going back to... up to the lodge. Okay. Okay, so this question is, let's say you're at Crater Lake, you have a group of passengers, and you're... Um, you're driving down to a location where you're going to be resting. You may have all their luggage on board, but you're not delivering it, so that's the first condition. Second condition is the passengers have all gotten off the, the bus. The lodge right, you've left them at the lodge up at Crater Lake, and now you're down in the village somewhere, exactly. So that time would be considered personal conveyance because you're moving to a resting location. <laughs> yeah, where it doesn't would be is if you are delivering their luggage to another location that's still considered driving. So just remember the passengers have to be off the bus. They could, you could still have suitcases on, or they're probably gonna take their luggage with them. But if you are moving and delivering the luggage, that also is, an, is considered driving well, time. It's typical that a charter bus driver is gonna stay in a different location if the passenger is staying at a high-end location. Right, so they put them up in a- driver somewhere else, so that back and forth time is personal. Correct. So the time, once you've unloaded, well, the passengers have unloaded, they've maybe they've taken their luggage, and you're just moving to your resting location, that is personal convenience. Okay. Yeah, but the passengers have to be off the vehicle. <coughs> yes, sir. Question? Um, when does the yard or terminal is the closest location returning from a customer? Would that be off duty? If you, okay, say that again. If you're going from... If you deliver to a customer, pick mm -hmm. up, and then a yard or terminal is the closest location? Yeah, by the guidance, that would have to be driving time. Really, you have to be going back to a hotel or be, you know, completely released from duty uh, to go and rest or to be, uh, you know, maybe go out to dinner or whatever. You're going to stay the night at the, at the yard or a terminal? If that's where you're going to be staying for the night, not necessarily anything job related, but that's just where you're going to be break. That's a good question. So you have you've dropped your load at a location, and you're going back to this uh, facility, and you're maybe your home. If it is the closest location, it's still going to be driving time based on the guidance, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Yes, sir. So to find the passengers in a motor coach, for example, if I have a couple of guys that work for the same company, we're all going to stay in the same hotel. Are they considered passengers on the motor coach? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, good question. Passengers? Does your motor coach have a sleeper berth in it? Okay, um, so you are driving, I would think, and that's a really good question, and I know we were talking about it yesterday in the office, if you're, you've got co-workers that are also co-drivers, and you're driving both of them back. Or they're uh, guides from other or companies. Or guides or whatever, right? Or guides from other, I, that's still a readiness to work. But you're, still, you're still transporting someone that is part of your job, your job function. Someone so once could, you're- Someone who could sue you if there was an accident. Yeah, so once your job function is ended, 
The question is, can the, has the motor carrier now released you from readiness to work? If one of your requirements is that you have to take the uh, a tour guide or someone to another location, then you're still considered driving. I'm talking about fellow employees. Sometimes we have extra employees that have to go along to supervise the trip. So cushion, just cushion that trip, whether they're drivers or not. But if they're part of my company, is that still considered a passenger? Or do we have to Uber them down? Well, let me let me table that one. I want to write it down, and I'll if you could, I'll get get my business card, and I'll get your email address, and I'll also let Dave know because I don't want to answer that incorrectly. The cushioning drivers are on duty, so cushioning drivers have to log on duty time mm -hmm. when they're on the bus riding around. It counts against their hours. That's true. So yeah, he's he's correct. When a co-driver is on the vehicle, they're still considered on duty, not driving. It's, they're st the, well, that was my, my first question was, are they in a sleeper berth, possibly? Have they climbed up in a sleeper berth? I mean, does your motor coach have that? I haven't seen one, but that would be a possibility. And then they would basically be in sleeper berth rather than off-duty. But cushioning drivers, cushioning drivers you're, you're, yeah, you're still driving somebody around. So, But I, I want to double check and make sure we get a, a, the, fully the correct answer, because I'm not 100% on that but I'll make sure that we get that question back to Dave and to you, okay?